Hey, Gabe. Hey, Tim. What's up? Uh, not much. I appreciate you hosting me in your home tonight. Oh, yeah, for this. yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, oh, since we're going to start the recording, cell interference from your phone can cause problems with the recording, so can you put your phone in airplane mode? But won't that keep us from receiving the latest emergency warning alerts about all those incoming North Korea ballistic missiles? Ah, uh, yes. Good point. I forgot. You have FOMO. Fear of missile obliviousness. Tim, I, I think you're being super critical. Welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. My name is Tim Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear security for a living, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host Gabe. Hey Tim, uh, it's Gabe. Uh, we're, we're here in my apartment uh, doing a little uh, more casual chat here. Joel couldn't make it. Uh, you know, he he heard the emergency warning from the missile. He uh, he sequestered himself in a Wendy's basement and is, is now working his way out by eating all of the Frosty mix, so it's going to take some time, I think. Godspeed, Joel. Watch out for that brain freeze. So we joke uh, about incoming missile warnings, but um, I'm happy that if the missile were to land over somewhere by the Pentagon we see out the window, I'm happy to have it here. I appreciate you uh, spending the last bit of days with me today, which is good because we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about the Hawaii... Missile Scare, uh, which happened uh, not too long ago. But of course, because I have this podcast and the way my brain thinks, we're going to also talk about a little known, really hard to find 1963 black and white movie called Ladybug, Ladybug. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny because I, so we're recording this on January 17th, 2018. The, the, there was this false alarm in Hawaii, which I think a lot of people have heard about. And when I told you about that, you like instantly came up like, oh, I know a movie for that. Like just out of nowhere. And I also Amazing. assumed that we'd be able to find it. And of course, we had to go to some uh, sketchy Russian website where I'm sure six different types of malware was downloaded to my computer. But well, we power through it for the purpose of the podcast. Yeah, this is all for you guys out there. So let's talk quickly about this uh, Hawaii missile scare, because maybe people uh, didn't hear about it or they want to hear more about what happened. At 8.07 a.m. on Saturday, Saturday, uh, January 13th, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, HEMA, activated its civilian early warning system with a message that was set to all the cell phones that they had on record in the state. Kind of those things you would get like Amber Alerts, crazy weather storms, flood warnings. Things yeah, like that. yeah, there's that, that like, annoying alarm that goes off, and you, you can't really ignore it. it, it it's really uh, loud. And... Well, this one is not one to ignore. The message read, Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. But what it was, accidental message. It was the result of human error when a staff member at HEMA selected the wrong drop-down menu option between PACOM CDW state only, which is uh, meaning missile incoming, and drill PACOM CDW state only, a.k.a. test missile alert. PACOM is the U.S. Pacific Command. I mean, come on, that's such an easy mistake to make. Those, those acronyms are just clear as, clear as day, right? Well, there certainly wasn't a are you sure pop-up that goes <laughs> on. Uh, it took 38 minutes before the don't worry about it message to be sent through the system. Well, they, they, I mean, they've been doing now news pieces. I guess they've fixed the, uh, or they've at least streamlined the, the process, but they show that like drop down menu and it doesn't really look that clear. And I can only imagine somebody right. getting in early and they have another coffee. <laughs> this, I, I'm surprised this hadn't happened before. That's, that's all I'd say. Well, we'll get into it. Uh, it kind of has happened before, um, but it will happen actually a few days later. Uh, nearly the same thing happened in Japan. Uh, it was corrected five minutes later. So they figured out a a quicker way, or maybe the system there is a little bit more responsive. What they sent out in Japan was a J alert, which is a system used to issue warnings to Japanese citizens about missiles, but also natural disasters, tsunamis. Uh, and in May of uh, 2017, a training exercise in New Jersey led uh, to a nuclear power plant warning that was sent out, uh, broadcast to two counties near the Hope Creek nuclear power plant in Salem County. Uh, they was blamed for a coding error for why that happened. You can imagine, pretty pretty scary. 
Uh, and then in last August, uh, this was also in the news, residents of Guam, which is not too far from North Korea, were shocked by an alert of civil danger warning broadcast by radios late at night. They thought it was a an attack, but it, it turns out it was just a false alarm as well. This is not the first time this has happened. Uh, a couple different examples of where this has happened before during the Cold War, which was, it was a long time ago for a lot of people, but it also was a time and place where false alarms happened quite often. Uh, we mentioned some of these on the podcast before. The 1950s, there was a flock of birds that triggered distant early warning line radar and looked like a Soviet bomber attack that was incoming, but turns out it was just a flock of birds. 1960s, meteor shower and lunar radar reflections uh, triggered a ballistic missile early warning system with NORAD. Turns out it was not an incoming attack. 1979, a staff member put the wrong cartridge in an early warning system and it, instead of a taped simulation that kind of ran through. And here's what would happen if an attack was going to, t- to take place. This ran through and people didn't know the tape was in there. So they thought it was an incoming attack. It took a while to figure out that uh, no other system was showing this warning. So they were able to figure out that it was a mistake. 1980, there's an example of a bad com- microchip that malfunctioned. And s- instead of saying that there were zero uh, incoming missiles, it said that there were 2,000. So that freaked people out a little bit. And then another one of the famous examples is in 1995, a rocket that was launched from Norway. The Russians were told about this incoming launch, completely civil missile system, but missiles and satellite launches look very similar. I think even the missile had some ICBM parts to it. The Russians freaked out about this. They had activated the uh, nuclear football in Russia. And it really took a lot of probably illegal, probably not to code type of conversations between lower level people in the U.S. and Russia to say, you know what, we're not going to to go ahead with any further escalation to finally de-escalate things. So this was a fact of life, and it now looks like we're starting to relive it. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, I guess the interesting thing that I was thinking about is, had this happened, you know, even two years ago, I think, this this might be in the news for a day or something, and... People might have not responded the way they did, but yeah, we're we're in some very interesting times with some of the stuff you know you've you've talked about here. As scary as it is today, you can only imagine that it was a lot worse back in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which was the year before the movie that we're going to talk about today, Ladybug. Ladybug came out. This was a movie that came out in December of 1963, written and directed by a husband and wife team, Frank Perry and Eleanor Perry. Uh, you may know them. Uh, maybe you don't, Gabe, because I don't think you were watching a lot of 1962 black and white movies. Neither, <laughs> neither, neither did I, to be honest. But they directed a movie called David and Lisa, their first film, nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Director and Screenplay. Not bad for their first outing. I, I think when I was looking for this movie on YouTube, they have a part of it. It's not really uh, in great quality, but I think the other thing that came up on the search was that David and Lisa movie, so that's there. So these are very much like a... Uh, these are auteur filmmakers. They write it, they direct it, they they do a lot of the work for it, made for low budget, and it's it's their character stories is largely what they're known for. He also did a movie that people know quite well, The Diary of a Mad Housewife, uh, which got nominated for another series of awards. He also did the movie uh, Mommy Dearest, which has got a couple Razzies back in the day. Mm. They're very good filmmakers, considered to be you know some of the best, and not only that, Frank Perry is the half-uncle of Katy Perry. Oh. That is there. not a joke. That is, I, I thought there was someone joking around on IMDb, but sounds like it's real. So instead of fireworks, she could have called it nuclear nuclear Ooh. attack or I don't know. That's I do the puns on the podcast. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Stick to my element. Instead of a normal episode where we chat for three hours about what the, something got right or something got wrong in a particular movie, uh, let want to do something a little different here. So I apologize if the sound quality is a little different. We're holding microphones. We're sitting around a, on a couch. Instead of sitting around a table like we're at a boardroom or the, the war room from Dr. Strangelove, and we're going to have a little nuclear fireside chat. <laughs> yep. I, I don't have a fire here. I could put the uh, that log, the Christmas <laughs> Yule log on the TV maybe. That'll help add to the atmosphere. That'd be good. Put it on yeah. mute, though. I don't want to mess with the right, recording exactly. any more than we have to. Uh, so it's Ladybug, Ladybug. It's a funny name, right? Why would... Why yeah, would... it sounds it sounds innocent. It sounds uh, doesn't sound like a movie about nuclear disaster, does it? Well, it's based off of a I did not know this. It's some sort of a child nursery rhyme. I guess all child nursery rhymes, if you think about it, are pretty creepy. This one in particular is pretty creepy. Uh, Gabe, do you want to do this one or should I? Uh, you, you do. I don't know how the cadence goes and everything. I watched some YouTube videos last <laughs> night trying to figure out what it was. Yeah. Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. 
your house is on fire, and your children all gone. Jeez. All except one, and that's little Anne, for she crept under the frying pan. I mean, why wouldn't you tell that to your children right before they go to sleep, right? <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy. It's a little <laughs> creepy, but gosh darn it, if this not fit, perfectly fits the, what this movie is about. Based on a true story about a school in California during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 that had, quote, thought the war had begun. The story was first told in an article in April 1963 of a weekly magazine called McHale's. Written by Lois Dickert. It was tells the story of Miralesti Elementary School in Los Angeles, California. That's your hometown? Yeah. That's not exciting. Too, really not too far. Okay. On In October of 1962, at 8.42 a.m., so again, early in the morning, an alarm failed right before a drill at an elementary school where they were going to run through the, the nuclear war drills. You know, duck and cover, go outside, get ready to go to the bunkers and the shelters. The telephone company said it wasn't their problem and there was no malfunction. So clearly... It must be a real alarm. Principal got on the bullhorn and told all of the teachers to move their groups of students home. So they started to walk home. The quote from the, the story from the Times says, The group started off briskly. Some pupils had to be dropped off a doorway. Others had to walk as far as 2.3 miles to be with loved ones. Those who would get home on this day, maybe the last day. Jeez. And at 8.50 a.m., the phone company called and said, Hey, don't worry about it. It was a false alarm. Oh, geez. But it's okay, though. They offered a free month of long-distance well, calling. This is after they're, <laughs> they're walking. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, yeah. They're, that's after they're, like, walking down. I mean, the, so the kids left the school, and then yeah. so the kids thought there was still a disaster, and and the school knew it was it was okay. Right. And the school officials got in some cars and tried to get the students uh, back to school and tell them the good news. Oh, the good news, they had to go back to school. So this story comes out in April of 1963. In 36 days of filming and a couple of months of post in December of that year, wow. it pops out on theater. So I guess when you don't have to do a lot of special effects, you get a faster turnaround. And it was amazing because it, it's a largely child cast for this movie. Right. Um, so to, to film that quickly with children, I mean, that not <laughs> not that they're not capable, but I, I just, I'm amazed they could get it done so efficiently and quickly. Maybe child uh, labor laws were a little bit uh, different back in the day. And you, could, the, you could put a kid to the work guy, for 12 hours. Is the guy off screen holding a whip or something? Uh, well, the di- director auditioned thousands of kids for the roles, uh, and he asked them, every one of them, what they thought the world would look like in 10 years. And according to him, during some of the, the, the interviews afterwards, he said three-fourths of the kids responded, quote, what world? As if they didn't think a world would be around wow. in 10 years. And he said this was his proof, not only why the movie was working as well as it did, but also that children comprehend more than adults give them credit for. So we tell this long story at the beginning because it's based on a true story, and a lot of people... Uh, maybe criticize this movie for not being realistic. Why would this happen? But if it's true that this is based off of a true story, cl- apparently it's based in fact. And the story that we see in the movie is pretty much this. Hmm. It's some uh, starts out with a teacher holding a watch, like a like a pocket watch, in in a slow and it was like a freeze frame. And then it kicks into action, and then the guy says, "Time's up," which everything he says for the first five minutes is, "By the way, this is about nuclear war." <laughs> Your time is up. Yeah. A student asked the teacher, well, this says we need to say whether or not a, an answer is f- true or false. Right. But can something be neither true or false? Yeah. And the teacher goes, hmm, interesting. You think about that. Yeah. No, you have to make a choice. Uh, yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what happens in this movie. Uh, the fun thing about this is that teacher, his name, William Daniels, the oh, actor. Okay. He played Mr. Feeney on really? Boy Meets World. Yeah. Really? So in a different type of school administration role. That's very interesting. Yeah. I thought the voice was like slightly familiar. That, that's very – I need to go back and watch that. I did not realize that. Mm-hmm. That's uh, cool. The, the whole story starts off with a alarm that goes off in the secretary's office. <laughs> Probably test ring. I was at Roxbury School No, yesterday. we had our test ring this morning at 9.30. We have it at 9.30 every morning. That's not the regular test pattern anyway. It always goes uh, white, yellow, blue, red, white. What does the yellow one mean? Manual says uh, nuclear attack within one hour. What's going on? What's wrong with that thing anyway? We don't know. It just started up. What's all the buzzing about? Never mind. Just get back in the other room. 
it's elementary school. It's somewhere in rural America. They don't say where, uh, but it was filmed in Pennsylvania. So we can assume maybe Pennsylvania, somewhere where there's yeah, kids some, that walk to school. Rural, yeah, something rural, a lot of farmland around. Where kids have to walk two miles uphill both ways to get yeah. to school. That kind of a thing. So as this happens, this alarm goes off. There's this box that has yellow, blue, red, and white. The, the, the letters Y, B, R, W. And the yellow... Which is good because it's a black and white movie, so I couldn't <laughs> exactly. tell. I was like, oh, it's the Y, so it's yellow. Super helpful there. Yeah. Um, so the yellow light button flashes and has a really loud alarm. And the secretary goes, wait a second. That means that there's an incoming nuclear attack within the hour. And so the principals and the teachers, they all get... Yeah. On the phone, and there's this just general, this can't be real. Telephone company's checking the equipment. Uh, Joel, get back to your room. Nothing wrong, but the equipment is, well, there must be something wrong. Hello, this is the principal speaking. Uh-huh. But that's impossible. Well, keep checking and call us back. They say seven things would have to go wrong before that alert would sound. Then seven things must have gone wrong. Yeah, the first reaction is kind of like it's almost a nuisance at first, and it is right. annoying. It's a it, it, the, the tone. It's an annoying alarm, and you're hearing in the movie. And I was kind of watching the movie, and I was getting annoyed by it too. And then it's like doubt, and then they're like, "Well, I guess we should probably do this. Let's you know, let's line all the kids up and." They kind of are just going through the motions, it seems, but they do end up marshalling all the children and start to walk back, start to walk them all back to their homes to get with their families. Exactly. The teacher says, as the story that we said at the beginning, he says, Teachers, take your children home. So we follow Mrs. Andrews, who, you know, she jokes that I can't believe on all days of today, I wore high heels. (laughs) So she's going to have to walk home during this whole thing. The, that particular actress also plays Tony Soprano's mom. Jeez, this is like, yeah, all Every, over the place. This is like the, uh, the the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon movie, but for everybody else. I've got, I've got a few more here, too. So Mrs. Andrews is upset. First, she thinks, oh, it's probably just a drill. It's a mistake, right? And then the secretary, um, whose name is, I think, Betty, uh, her, she's, she's pregnant, and she's a little freaked out about this whole thing. She says, well, maybe it's not a false alarm, which then gets Mrs. Andrews all freaked out. You don't tell it to someone before they go on a walk. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the rules here are, well, if there is an accident, we can take the children home. We can always just get them back later. But if it's real, shouldn't they be with their families right. when yeah. this happens? Yeah. Uh, except for Peter. Poor Peter's family lives too far away. So he has to, quote, stay and watch. Yeah. Whatever that means. Uh, no, I, I thought it was interesting. You know, like you said, there was this question of like, oh, is this real? Is this not? I mean, there seems to be going back and forth. So the, the, the what was the teacher, Mrs. Andrews? Mm-hmm. Um, when she's walking with the children, they're kind of at first they're kind of talking about, oh, it's my birthday tomorrow. What are they're all happy. Yeah, they're all like happy. And then all of a sudden one of them starts asking like, well, what if it's real? This is what the burst is going to look like. I mean, it, it's it kind of goes back and forth between like, oh, life is normal. And then like, well, what if this is like we only have like minutes left to live? You know, I don't, I don't have a child, but I have a nephew who's right around this age. He likes to repeat things back that he hears from his family, from us. He comes and visits. I will say as many random things as possible, hoping that he will repeat them back at home, and it just sounds like nonsense back at home. <laughs> he was, he's was he been on the podcast before. He We did an episode with the Dr. Seuss book, the Butter Battle book, so please go on and check that episode out. Uh, you can hear about Jairus, uh, my nephew. But this one of these kids is so blessed say about it, right? He's like, oh, yeah, it's a, probably it'll be like a one megaton blast, surface, uh, surface blast around the Nike missile base. And it'll be crazy. There'll be a huge flash. This, this was this was Tim Westmeyer in sixth grade. That's the <laughs> talking about Nike missile bursts. Well, I hope not because he says it's a thousand times brighter than the sun, and everyone catches on fire. And this little girl starts screaming how scared she's going to be, and she runs home because her house is right down the street. Yeah. And she goes to her dad and says, "Daddy, Daddy, the bomb! The bomb is coming! Everyone is going to catch on fire. They're going to burn us. We need to get in the shelter in the basement." And the dad's working, and he doesn't believe what, what's happening. So he like hits her, yeah, and says, yeah. "Go inside the house." Yeah, they, they, yeah, he like doesn't believe it at all. The mom doesn't either. The mom yeah. just like, "Well, you're you're playing, right? Why are you at home 
go back to school. If the daughter just wants to go in the basement. She wants to protect her family. It was interesting in this movie. There's like all these different reactions to the news. So there was that one. Then there's another child who, as the movie's taking place, you know, kids are starting to split off from this mm -hmm. group. And there was another girl who goes to see her mom and tells her what's going on. And the mom like immediately says, yes, like, let's get in the, let's get in the shelter. They go down the shelters, like start praying. They get on their knees. They start saying prayers. And like, so to see that like different, right. you know, I think the movie was, did a good job of showing the kind of different possible reactions that the adults, you know, might've had hearing this news. Uh, the actor who plays the dad, his name is Richard Hamilton. Uh, he played a couple different roles. Um, people may know him as the partner of uh tommy lee jones the first partner the old man in the first man in black movie really but what i know him as is a character in this movie called silkwood which is about a whistleblower uh who talks about dangers in a nuclear uh fuel fabrication plant this movie stars i think it's uh kurt russell Cher, and meryl streep it's a pretty good movie we're going to cover it on the podcast at some point but he plays one of the uh, people in that movie so again continuing this interesting connections here so this little girl her mom and her dad don't believe her, and she she grabs a fish bowl, fair pet fish, and hides under the bed and starts crying. Yeah, a series of things like that happen in the movie where children protect something. Their response is to grab something that they love and protect it, whether yeah. it's a fish in a fish bowl, a frog. Uh, one kid tries to basically trick his grandma to going down in the basement because she doesn't want to go in the basement. And she's a little senile. Yeah, uh, that's a whew, that's a scene. Uh, and then you mentioned yeah, the, the, mo the mom. Yeah, they go down and start praying. And, yeah, There's an interesting chat there um, about the little girl and, the, and, the, and this boy talk about, well, who invented the bomb, right? Was it God? Well, no, bad men invented it. Well, who made the bad men? God. Will God stop the bomb? Well, maybe if he wants to. And then the kid starts screaming about, why, mom, why won't God stop the bad men from yeah. the bomb? It's a... There's a lot of these little character moments, and I think this is where the movie shines, Yeah, is in those little scenes. There's all, all these little kind of subplots going on, these children whose parents have these reactions. I think the main story, if you could call it one, is there's this group of children that they go to uh, this girl's parents' house, and they have a bomb shelter. Yeah, she brags about it. Yeah. She and... says, why would I worry about this? I have a bomb shelter. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the other kids in the back is like, I wish I had one. Yeah. It's like the latest, like, uh, yeah, action figure. It's like, oh, I got my bomb shelter. But they go down there, and it, it ends up becoming like uh, you texted me last night as we were watching. You said like a Lord of the Flies type thing where this one girl kind of takes charge and is issuing orders about, oh, you can only drink so much water. And they she does like a feeding of this really gross like ration, you know, like uh, multi-purpose multi soy uh, grits. Yeah, <laughs> it was like oatmeal from hell. <laughs> And uh, as this is going on, you know, the, the children are having really bad reactions to taking orders. They don't know why they're down there. They want to leave. In this particular plot line, there's a pretty heartbreaking thing where there's this, this young boy and, you know, this this girl that she that, – that he's uh, – you know, he's kind of got a little thing for her. Steve and Sarah. Yeah. S Sarah's the new girl. They both bond over the fact that they like singing. Yeah, opera music, mm -hmm. uh, as yeah, as, as children love to talk about the <laughs> opera, uh, apparently. And she, so all the children are in the shelter, and she tr she's like banging on the door. She hears them in there, and she tries to get in, and the girl who's in charge and the other ones are like, you can't come in here. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough water, all that kind of stuff. They send her away. Yeah. And um, and she goes running off, finding any kind of place to hide. She sees an old refrigerator, which, Tim, you told me recently. I didn't know this was a thing, but this was like a big danger. Yeah. Well, I, I knew about it, but then we just did an episode on the Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the famous nuke the fridge scene. And our friend Alex, who was on the podcast, uh, he says <laughs> when he was a child, his mom told him, don't go playing around in the junkyard and go inside of a refrigerator because I guess you can't open a refrigerator from the inside. There's issues with either the latch on the outside or the suction air pressure and or there are just heavy doors. So she goes in, but, but she's crying because she can't because there's no one at home. Her family's not at home. So she has no one to essentially die with. So yeah. she's freaking out Yeah, because the kids don't know whether or not this is real. That's the running thing is whether or not this alarm is real. Yeah. Back at the school, they think it's it's a false alarm. Supposedly the, f the phone company said, we figured it out. It's okay. But it's no 
uh, it's no uh, sense of peace to the students because they don't know the ones that are walking. This is before cell phones. Yeah, exactly. This is like a Seinfeld and they're in a episode rural... plot. No one, there's no cell phones, right? So this happens. Yeah, and they're in this rural area. Nobody, very few people are around, so they can't spread the word. Right. But I think there's this great scene where Betty, the, the secretary, she's in a daze walking around the school. She goes in one of the homerooms of the students and starts cleaning up. Uh, and if you think a bomb's about to take place, it's very sad thinking that this is really her – what she's doing is really rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Yeah. Then there's this very, I would say, a little over the uh, – hitting you on top of the head moment where she's in a sandbox and she's playing with sand and there's a, a little fort castle and they, she takes the cannon off and buries it. Yeah. It's... And then puts two people, like little toy man and woman and a baby, up and she smiles. Some sort of sense of – Wanting to correct what's wrong with the world, uh, and then she's told it's a false alarm, and she and then I don't think she's like, well, great, that's fantastic, we can go back to the way we were. It's more, can we go back? Like what this world that we lived in before this, I now realize how dangerous it is. It's kind of how I read that. I don't know how you read that. No, I I thought it was similar, and I thought the end of the movie drove that home. So, uh, is it, who were the two kids' names again? Steve and Sarah. Steve and Sarah. Young, so young love. That's maybe not gonna last. Yeah. Years. Well, so Sarah Sarah goes to hide in this refrigerator, and who knows what happens to her? Whether she's able to get out, and Steve uh, he he runs out looking for her, and runs is, right past her. Yeah, runs right past her refrigerator, and is kind of in this area with all this kind of junk, and there's an airplane overhead, and the sound of the airplane's getting stronger and stronger, and he kind of looks up and he thinks that you know this is the right. airplane that's gonna drop the bomb, and he keeps yelling. Uh, stop, 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 stop. And I think at the end of the movie, you almost wonder, I was wondering, I'm like, wait, is it a false alarm? Like it just ends, it just fades to it black just ends much, right yeah. there with this, this noise of the airplane. And you're like, yeah, well what? And, and I think that's what the, um, that maybe that's what they were going for to leave you with that question mark. So clearly a lot of the adults in the, in the movie, their reaction, even after they find right. out about it, they're, they're still shaken. So I think we're really left to to wonder what whether or not it's it's happened. I think it, the story works either way. Some people really hate that kind of an ending. I know my wife, when she watches movies, she hates the, well, I don't know whether or not they're real or not or whether this is a dream or those kind of things. I think it, if used well, it works. And I think yeah. this is a good example. Well, and, you know, fast forward to, um, you know, 2018 here, and mm -hmm. I think – we're asking some of the same question. It's strange because I mean, a lot of what's been going, you know, what they're saying in the news about about the the Hawaii thing. Nobody's really hit it on the head that like people like actually thought that there was going to be a nuclear bomb and like, what does this mean for geopolitics? Everyone's kind of picking apart. Oh, the computer screen didn't say that. And it's almost like we're kind of avoiding this mm -hmm. like more serious debate that we should be having of how messed up is it that things have gotten this far that we. We actually think that this is a real possibility. So the, I read stories in the Washington Post about children while this was happening. They were outside playing, and then they get the alarm on their phones because now everybody, unlike the children in this movie, have cell phones. So they get these alerts. Stories of children running inside gutters and trying to get underground, hun hunkering down with their loved ones for 38 minutes trying to find out what was happening. And then you know, what really hit at home was someone emailed – our podcast. I think I shared this with you a few minutes ago. Yeah. Terrence, uh, who lives in Hawaii. Terrence, thanks for sending this. It's a very powerful story, very emotional about what his Saturday morning was like when this happened. He was he was in a wedding of a coworker, and they were taking photos of the groom, and he gets the alert on his phone, and I think probably responds pretty appropriately, probably how I would respond if I got an alert on my phone that said, yeah. incoming missile strike. My first reaction is not well, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can think about it. Well, why would North Korea do this? Why would anybody do this? But if the official warning says this is happening, I respond. Well, know? yeah, and, and I think Terrence, I mean, like yourself, I mean, Terrence is attuned to these kind of issues. And, sure. you know, yeah, he, he's clearly knowledgeable about history, your Cold War, nuclear weapons, that kind of thing. So, you know, I wonder somebody like me who's not, you know, not <laughs> plugged into this, I wonder if I would react the same way. So I, I hope that it's not because he listens to the podcast quite a lot that this caused this problem, uh, this, this premeditated thought of, of reaction. Uh, he says that he took some of the things that we said in the episode that I did with my sister, uh, the Blast from the Past episode, which is, you know, a, a romantic comedy, but we talked a lot about civil defense and how people respond 
Uh, so if some of those things kicked in, that's great. But really, I mean, you imagine trying to assemble your team of people together and to convince friends and family, like you may not know what's happening, but you've received an alert right. and you're trying to tell them to do something and you don't know what to do because maybe there isn't a bunker where they're at or, you know, or, or a basement or something. Right. So they go, I think in this, in Terrence said he went uh, in the, what's that? The house yeah, the housekeepers. Uh, uh, yeah, quarters. housekeepers area, which which was um, a little bit more secure. Yeah, a little bit more secure. You know, not a not a fallout shelter, but was able to kind of get it. You know, get everyone in there. And I, I mean, some of the stuff he talks about is just incredible. Like uh, going down the the exit or the stairs to get to the this area, and just how he was just praying and and thinking about. Well, don't we have a missile defense system? That's you know that might be reliable and and yeah. can uh, you know maybe protect us and thinking as well about how was he going to reach his family and if he went if he left the bunker he, I mean he left the bunker at one point and talks about well I'll be able to see the missile coming and be able to get back in won't I and <laughs> probably pro- probably not there Terrence yeah. I think <laughs> those things if they're intercontinental and they are flying from space they have like yeah. 10 seconds maybe from when they enter the atmosphere and where they hit the ground uh it would it would you would see a a flash before you heard anything but just, I mean, amazing to think about, you know, the right. things that he was thinking about and that went through his head. I mean, he tells this great um, part of the story where he sees the um, the bride and groom. And yeah. he's just like, the groom is totally calm, like comforting his bride. And um, these things, like these events bring out parts of humanity that you can only imagine. I mean, we're lucky to have this this account of it, you know, sent to us. And I can only imagine all the different stories from that day. Uh, thank God everyone's okay, but just all the incredible experiences that must have happened. I mean, the biggest thing that I worried about on my wedding day was that the DJ <laughs> hadn't arrived yet before the ceremony, and he wasn't supposed to arrive yet. He was going to arrive when he needed to arrive. Yeah. But that was the only thing I was freaking out about that day. It was like, where were we going to get lunch? We ended up at Subway before the, the wedding, and it's like, ah, oh, I didn't want to go to Subway. I hate Subway. Uh, but that was my worry of the day. I can't imagine <laughs> what it would be like. Yeah, no, this is – well – Thankfully, everything ended well. Um, Yeah. Yeah, Terrence writes a a hotel, uh, you know, on one of his trips out of the shelter to go try to make a phone call. One of the hotel employees told him that it was a um, it was a false alarm and reality started to set in. But actually, the the wedding did go off. And but he still said that it was kind of like waking up from a nightmare, that it it wasn't real, but it, it really felt real. And he he thought for a while that he had might have twenty minutes to live. He was pissed that you know kind of the world leaders that are you know responsible for all this and some of those same feelings sure. that we saw in the movie about who's, who's responsible, yeah. who who makes the bomb, who uses yeah. it. Because if this is a false alarm in the movie, people will have to deal with it. Although we can talk about, I mean, if this story that supposedly takes place in Los Angeles was real during the Cuban Missile Crisis, I mean, what was the the re- response from that? People freaked out about it. There was a sense of urgency to try to de-escalate the Cold War arms race. There were arms control treaties that came after that. There was confidence-building measures between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Hotlines got started. The red phone of being able to talk to the foreign leaders during a crisis. You know, I think that was another one of those misnomers because there was actually teletape was like a written thing because oh, okay. that would be better for translations. Right. But things like that, this came out of a real crisis. And you can say, did we learn from that? In a way we did, but we still have the bombs the way we do. Will this be a lesson for us? I think the reaction, at least in terms of the government, has been, this is a state issue, right? Isn't that what the White House said? This is a state issue. We're glad that they took the blame. Uh, I personally would have hoped if uh, any president would go on TV and say, this is what happened. We are reassuring the people that in the event of this taking place, we have we'll we'll manage it. A sense of calm. I think people are so anxious about this crisis that did happen with in Hawaii, maybe because there isn't that level there. I don't. I don't know. I think these are all questions that are fascinating, and I, th- I like what Ladybug Ladybug did, and how they handled yeah. some of these very questions. Well, so yeah, and I mean, look, I mean, there's just so much to talk about. You know, the bigger issues. Of how do we fight back? And you know, how do we uh, get away from this fear? How do we? comfort the masses how do we not go to the brink like we were before but i guess from a more practical perspective i mean i'm fascinated just at how this could happen and right it's an interesting problem how do you let people know this is going on so i guess going back to the movie uh, do they good do a good job i mean is that really how it happened back then where there was just a little box in the school and there was a 
there was a light that went on, and if it was the yellow light, then you <laughs> you ran, <laughs> ran for cover. For this episode, for our, our nuclear fireside chat here, I'm going to really preface it at the beginning. This is not one of those normal episodes where I like to poke fun at realistic things or non-realistic things, because this is not one of those movies where this really matters. But I will say, overall, this movie does a fairly good job of describing mm -hmm. early warning systems and how they were transmitted emergency information to people. So this this little box that we see, the YBRW box, which is the actually has a name. In 1952, the system got started to be in place. The Bell and Lights Air Raid Warning System, which was designed by the Bell Telephone Company, founded by Alexander Graham Bell's father-in-law, which later, through a couple of different acquisitions, became AT&T. Uh, but this system is very similar to the experience of World War II during air raid sirens that would indicate whether or not an attack was imminent, whether it was happening, and whether or not it was done okay. in the all clear. So it's not exact, but it's it's pretty close. Okay. This system used regular phone lines to transmit sound and sight warnings to special boxes at schools, hospitals, fire stations, police stations, government offices, places where this information was needed to be to be heard. Uh, in civil defense centers, either nationally but mostly local, would dial on a rotary phone and relay messages to the boxes. So yellow means that an attack is is could happen. That it's a warning to watch out. Okay. Red was attack is very imminent. Okay. Like this is you know, duck and cover. Okay. As opposed to seek shelter. Yeah. Right. White was all clear, and it's all over, or either it was a false alarm or it's done. So you can come out now. Okay. There was a stop message, which wasn't necessarily a light, but it would, uh, on the rotary phone where you would send out the messages, it was clearing the last thing. It would stop the, the alarm from happening. Okay. And there was also this, we don't know what to do with this button yet, but we're going to make it so we can build it on later blue. So it was like a special purpose that so we could use this for something else when we come up with it later. You okay. know, build future capacity deal. Okay. Uh, the system was in an ad by uh, the Bell uh, Telephone Company. It said it was foolproof because <laughs> it didn't need to rely, rely on commercial power because okay. it's telephone lines. So, right, right, right. And it's always active. So if the line messes up, it's not like it's going to send a signal. But it, apparently this happened. I mean, this happened in 1962 during the worst possible time that it could happen. Yeah. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so I think that's certainly... And an interesting case there, but this system didn't last forever. It was eventually replaced um, by this other program that we talked about, uh, Conelrad, which is a radio uh, civil defense tool. I dedicated radio channels back in the day, 640 or 1240 AM radio frequencies. Radios back in the day used to actually have dedicated civil defense logos on where those spots would be, and you're supposed to turn to those dials oh, in well. the event of a crisis. Oh, well. Connell Red was a very widespread personal home use for figuring out what was happening and to receive messages. Wow. If you go on YouTube and you search Connell Red nuclear warning, you can hear what the actual warning was when they would do drills uh, and what it would have been if there wasn't a nuclear attack. Wow. And I mean, so today, what do we have? I mean, we have flash forward now to 2018. Clearly, we have yep. blasts that go out over text message. Do we still have radio stations? Do it, Does it go out over TV? I mean, how would... How would, let's say, the worst happens and, you know, somebody were to launch something at us? I mean, how would... Technology, as it comes about, gets changed. You know, Twitter would probably have a lot of messages, but then the question becomes, do you believe what you read on Twitter? Yeah. These alerts that go out over the phone, uh, it's a lot like car alarms. The first couple times you hear a car alarm go off, you go, my car is going to be stolen. The 10th or 17th time you hear it happening, you go, eh. Right, well, like it, you haven't paid attention to it anymore. It was so that's a worry, right? Yeah, and it was amazing. I mean, I, I've read I've read some accounts from what happened in Hawaii. Some people, you know, just freaked out. Like, there's a story about a mother, you know, take her kids and oh right into gosh, the bathroom, fill up the tub with water. They leave their pet chinchilla out because they just figure you know can't have him running around. They, they really take it seriously. People are emotional, crying. And then I read another one where there's some guy who like looked at his phone and just put it back down and went back to bed or something. And he just assumed that it was, it was fake and, you know, without even having that happen before. So, I, you know, I wonder, I mean, you brought this up earlier. What if this happened again? Would people just say, Oh yeah, we've been through this before 38 right. minutes later, you know, this is going to be false alarm. Crying nuclear wolf kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's certainly a worry. Uh, you can go to our episode that we did on threads, which is a movie about existential dread and slash 
uh, what would happen in the event of a nuclear attack in the in the middle of the UK in a kind of a small a small town, not London. You don't see the London Eye explode. You see right uh, some small town uh, in Sheffield. Um, you you see. We talked a lot about uh, protect and serve, survive, this warning system and series of uh, PSAs that would, would take place. And their plan was we would have a bunch of pamphlets. We would print them out and we'd have them ready. And then if there was a crisis, it wouldn't be a bolt out of the blue, receive a text message, everyone freak out. It would be a slow buildup. Some okay. sort of a crisis takes place and you prepare people. So right. you hope that if this – you hope, geez, if, if this happens – you hope it's not a bolt out of the blue. All of a sudden, you wake up and you receive a text message kind of deal. You would hope that people would start to prepare. There would be alerts on television. They would say, be on the lookouts for these types of warnings. Be not too far from places where you can run to. Okay. Be by your family. Things like that. It's also the emergency broadcast system, that you know, the, the staticky noise on the TV. That... I used to, when I was a kid, I used to hate that because I'd be like watching TV yeah. and then I was like, oh, I have to wait. Well, man. that's part of it. I mean, that is part of the system that would alert people to an incoming attack. That And that sound, that sound always freaked me out. Like something about it that should. sound. And I remember I only it heard it once when it wasn't a drill. It was like uh, I, I grew up on Long Island, so there was some, you know, susceptible to some flooding in certain areas. And there was like a flood warning, and it went off, and I I got really scared. Like I, I was I was young, and you know, it just really freaked me out. But well, so this is something to worry about. You know, the the idea of being prepared and false alarms happen, and we feel comfortable as bad as Terrence's day was, as bad as the the woman with the with the small child's was. It, it ended up being okay. You know, in the sense that it was over and. It was sad when it happened, but it's there was no crisis. Right. What worries me and a lot of other people that think about uh, nuke uh, crises and how, how can they develop into a full-blown nuclear attack is what if this story is told from the North Korean perspective? North Korea doesn't have an amazing satellite system. They don't have warning that looks over the horizon, radar systems. You know, what if they are told by foreign leaders, we are going to consider t- attacking you? I don't know whether or not I'm going to maybe do a first strike. I'm going to leave that option on the table. I'm not going to tell you what's happening. We're moving troops and missile systems and, and nuclear-capable bombers closer and closer to North Korea. Yeah. And then there's some sort of a, a report that this is happening, that this is an alert that's taking place. You know, the North Korean version of Twitter pops up and says, there's an attack incoming. And that's how wars can start, accidentally. Yeah. I'm not too worried about North Korea deciding one of these days, just in the morning, Kim Jong Un is going to decide to attack, right? Right. It's uh, maybe Seth Rogen and James Franco decide to interview him and freak him out, uh, and he decides to attack. That's probably not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is it's going to be some kind of a miscommunication, a, cri- a smaller crisis further escalates and develops. That is what worries me. It's no, it's it's a, uh, and if you're worried, I'm very worried because I'm worried about, about everything that. related to this as it is. Um, I guess I guess the question is, I mean, during the Cold War, we've probably talked about this, or you've probably talked about this on the show at some point. I mean, was there like a phone that they could call, like, if there was sure. a false launch? I mean, we don't have those diplomatic ties with North Korea, right? It's a big problem. Um, I think I can kind of talk about this. My, my work back in the early 2000s, uh, mid-2000s, when it looked like the U.S. and North Korea were going to do a little bit more being cooperative, there was the six-party talks, which was a series with Russia, China— uh, Japan, U.S., North Korea, and South Korea, North, and there were these talks that looked like they were going to develop into a deal where North Korea would agree to reduce its nuclear program in exchange for food aid and peace agreements and things like that. Uh, so part of what my work did was we started to do more science engagement exchanges between North Korean scientists who were eager for even basic science access for journals, uh, being able to collaborate on papers. And then our scientists were trying to find out, you know, there what was happening in North Korea and also just engage, do what we did during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet yeah. Union. Scientists would engage in things like joint verification experiments uh, where they would go to each other's nuclear test site and say, hey, look, if we set up this surveillance system and we, we test a bomb, you can figure out what, what our systems are, right. which is good because that way we know what you have and we you know what we have and mm-hmm. we don't have to worry about the worst case scenario. Yeah. So we tried to do a lot of that stuff, and it worked, but it was really hard because there weren't a lot of connections between the United States and North Korea. You had to work through the United Nations mission okay. in New York. Okay. It was very slow. You never knew if you sent out a message who would be reading it and translating it and to get it to the people you actually want to talk to. There is an email, right? You can't just email somebody. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's very difficult. So there are certainly channels 
you know, we work a lot through Sweden. We work through South Korea, a place that you might visit in the next couple of months. Yes, the, yes. The, the, the Blue Room along the DMZ. Like those are places that exist, but there's those channels don't get open quite a lot. I think before the most recent opening dealing with the Olympics that are going to take place next month in South Korea, the South Koreans would continually call once a week that line and no one would answer saying, hey, we're ready to talk. Hey, wow. we're ready to talk. Well, they don't answer. They don't pick up the phone. Wow. They do bullhorn messages. <laughs> they go on like a bullhorn and the U.S. Uh, or North South Korea would, would shout things and say, we're ready to talk. Please answer the phone. Like that's the level of communication. So it's like the end. It's like a bad date, or like a yeah, fall out of a bad date. You're right. just trying to call and they're not answering. It's like uh, John Cusack in Say Anything, where he's holding up the the boombox, but yeah. instead of a, a sad ballad of a love ballad, it's please answer the phone. I have things to say. There's an emergency. You know. So if this happens now, you want these types of crisis communication management. Yeah. I mean, we want more like this with China, let alone with North Korea. So that's certainly something to be concerned about and to worry about. Mm. But, you know, when you want to make sure that you don't just worry, you want to think about what kind of agency you have. You don't mm. want to just freak out about this and throw your hands up in the air and say, this is too much. I can't deal with it. You don't want to watch a, a nuclear movie and see a mushroom cloud and go, well, crud, what am I supposed to do about this? Yeah. You want to know to, to do something. And there are people that are doing something. There are people that are using this moment to try to rally people in favor of nuclear disarmament, at least maybe not trying to do what the, the upcoming uh, Trump nuclear posture review about you know what we should use nuclear weapons for says we should use them for a lot more, maybe using them to respond to cyber attacks, maybe Jeez. using them, uh, building up a bunch more, build new types of weapons, new missions. People saying, hey, look what just happened in this moment of crisis. People are freaking out about this. Maybe we should calm down a little bit. Maybe we should not take it to the brink every time. This is not a negotiation. This is real. Well, I, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think in an ideal world, I, I I wish that that's the direction we could go in. You know, we're unfortunately stuck in this in this situation where these are real concerns. And, you know, I guess I, I think about if it did you know, if the worst had happened, would I know what to do? I was struck in the sure. movie. In the movie, they had like this plan. There was this drill. I mean, if if I was sitting at work and this alert came, you know, nuclear attack, I, there's no like workplace drill for what we do. I, I think they would just run the fire alarm, release us in the streets, and then we'd be outside. I mean, I guess in in the Hawaii thing, did people behave the way they should have behaved during this? Or was it a mixed bag? And do we need to go back to these times of doing these drills? So the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, is there was a story about how they started to do a little couple panel discussions on what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. They also do things, what to do in the event of a zombie attack. So it's kind of hard sometimes to take them seriously. Hawaii started to do air siren drills last year during the, after North Korea and, and the situation over Guam was a, was a problem. So, I mean, do we should we prepare these drills? <laughs> This, this, these were debates that were done back in the day about what was the value of civil defense. The big question then was, what's the value of civil defense in a world where North Russia and the United States launched all their weapons? Because it doesn't matter if you're in a bunker, you're going to survive to live right. in a, a, a hellscape. Yeah. Now, if it's a question of one bomb going off here or there or because of North Korea and you would want to be able to, to deal with that, you know, I think it doesn't hurt to look up and— and find what you can do to protect yourself and your family. Like those are things that are you should th treat it as if it was a natural disaster. It's not something to be crippled with fear, but it's something to know that to have a plan as you would respond to an earthquake. Or you know, we live in Washington D.C. What if there's a terrorist attack? Right. Using chemical weapons, for example. What do we do? You know, yeah. you should have some kind of a plan. No, that, that's just good preparedness. And it's funny because we are so like in we're so responsive or reactive I should say to this because I remember after 9/11 sure. yeah. there was like all these trainings about, you know, if you're in an office and they they handed out emergency kits and it kind of like waned along, you know, over the years it, people stopped paying attention to it and you know, the emergency kit slowly, you know, I had an emergency kit that was like five years old. <laughs> on my last yeah. job. The water was like <laughs> deflate. The water uh, bag was deflated. Yeah. Anyway, here's what I think the movie does really well. So we like to joke here about realism. You know, the, is the bomb according to nuke map? Correct. Is, is this going to annoy Tim uh, because of what was on the screen? Yeah. Now what this movie does really well in terms of realism is the human response. It's utter confusion and disorganization plans exist They're, they have these go home teams and they run the drills but they don't have enough buses only one of the groups gets to have a, a bus to get home everyone else has to walk 
They don't know what to do to organize. There's no sense of communication. How do you recall people? They're just doing it as they're figuring it out, right? Kind of probably how uh, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency took 38 minutes. And I think, I think they had to create some kind of a response to alert people that yeah. it was okay. Yeah. They had to, cr- to code that on the spot. I think that's really what would end up happening to a large degree. There's so many plans, but it's like the old Mike Tyson phrase. You have a plan when you get in the ring until you get punched in the face. <laughs> and... <laughs> And the other phrase that I've heard before is the you can develop an amazing military strategy, but the enemy gets a vote. Like they get to decide how you deal with it. It's yeah, not a perfect vacuum. Right. I think a lot of nuclear war planners uh, probably they have responses to things, and a lot of it is it leads someone to say, "Well, the enemy can do something to stop this. Therefore, we should act fast. We need to be the first ones to attack." Because that way, then no one else can can do anything about it. If we have to fight a nuclear war where we're both firing back and forth. That's not going to last very long. That's why we have things like the nuclear football is because quick decisions need to be made, and our command and control system may not be able to survive mm. the first couple of bombs. So you have to get everything be redundant. You have to act fast. Right. So I think this movie does a really good job showing realism in terms of the people and, and their response. And not only that, but as an art form, you know, we mentioned all these different people being famous for other things, but these were unknowns at the time. Right, yeah. A lot of child actors who are very good. The movie starts out with this guy named Joel. I don't think it's related to our Joel. No, he's not the Wendy's Joel. Not the Wendy's Joel, but he gets in trouble and he sends it to the principal. And he's just kind of goofy. It's not perfect acting, but it's just like a kid joking. I don't know why I got in trouble, not the other guy. It sets this tone of realism yeah, the, throughout the film, I, I mean, it's the, perfect. The movie felt almost like too ordinary it didn't feel like a movie it felt like i you know was watching you know toward the end it starts to get you know they they get in with the metaphors and, and the things like that but yeah i mean the first like 20 minutes it feels like i just i'm watching a day at school and that's i, hmm. I think that helped to it helped to like kind of prime the viewer to really go along for the ride and and, and experience that you know all that stuff you were talking about have you ever heard of this movie called before sunrise no uh it's a movie i think it's got um i forget the french actress's name but the it's got ethan hawk in it it's uh, a movie by the same guy that did days to confuse and boyhood okay and it's basically it's a two people fall in love and they walk around Paris and the movies, nothing happens really. It's just kind of them walking and chatting. I think this is the nuclear equivalent of it Uh, where nothing really happens. It's a lot of conversations and, and stories and character studies, but it's, it's very good. So let's, let's wrap up here because I want this to be a quick episode. It's kind of one long, parking lot discussion let us know over twitter and facebook and email if you like this kind of style we can sprinkle these in here and there but i think it fits really well with the type of story that we're trying to talk about here let's do our rating system we have to do this we got to yeah it's Uh consistent one through five uh but we like to tailor it because we are super critical so it just makes sense that we'll do the same thing for our rating system i think for this one you already hinted at it one out of five cans of multi-purpose soy grits one can will last you two weeks in the bunker, but with five cans, you can last out nuclear winter. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about you, Tim. I'm feeling pretty hungry tonight, so I, I think I could go for four uh, four of those cans. Of, four cans. Uh, yeah, four cans. No, I, I thought it was, um, as we said, just a very realistic portrayal. No, no big special effects here, nothing fancy. But I was just struck watching this movie last night uh, about, and then reading about the Hawaii responses that, yeah, just like in the movie, there were this whole range of different reactions from people, people just kind of responding. And the fact that that was shown both with adults and children made it all the more powerful. So I, yeah, I, maybe, maybe I've been swept up by, you know, the zeitgeist of this, uh, yeah. yeah, of this, uh, you know, of this thing that happened and I was kind of primed to enjoy it. But uh, I, I thought it was very well done. Well, I hope this bunker that has this multi-purpose soy grits is well stocked because I'm also going to take four cans. Oh, nice. Four cans of multi-purpose soy grits off the wall. Four can- uh, I g- agree with pretty much everything you say about the perfect time and place for us now. I'm sure it was even more of a thing for the people that saw this movie uh, back in you know 1963. I don't know how well this movie did. I tried to find some information about it. Critics like it, but it's really hard to find. It certainly does not have the same cachet as the rest of the 1960 war movies that came out, like Doctor Strangelove, Failsafe, uh, all kinds of nuclear war movies came out right around 63, 62, 64. Because Q Missile Crisis, it was right on people's minds. It was really hard to find this movie. And so I, I w- it's one of those that I'm glad that we talked about it because 
most people may not be able to find it. You know, look for it. Hopefully it comes back on Netflix at some point. But I would say that the thing that keeps it for me from being a five, if I'm just going to talk a little bit about the movie itself, it does feel a little long. Even with all the character studies, there is definitely a part where once the kids get in the bunker, that it maybe goes on a little bit too long. But I, just, I think that those are silly complaints, too. But it keeps me from giving it a five or even yeah. a 4.5. It's definitely that mix of, is this a story about characters or is it an anti-nuclear war propaganda movie? You know, okay, say it is, right? It still is a powerful emotional story. Yep. And it's told very well. And I think the style of, was it Daniel and Lisa, the other one story? I'm going to have to look it up. David and Lisa, I think. I'm going to watch this movie now because if I like, if they, I think the style is very similar. Okay. I'm going to watch this movie. And that's a pretty good sign. Perfect transition here. If you like that movie and this movie and all this whole this story, I have three things to recommend you check out. The first is, hey, go back to, in our podcast archive here and listen to the episode we did on the Twilight Zone, original Twilight Zone episode called The Shelter. We did a podcast on this. It's a very similar story of a, of a what turns out to be a false alarm um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. A family is ha- celebrating a birthday or a retirement party with some of their neighbors. That family built a bunker. They went underground. The neighbors who had been making fun of them a second ago for building a bunker asked to be let in. They're not let in because there's no room. And you have these great conversations and tears the neighborhood apart. And it turns out it's a false alarm, which is awkward once they break the door down. So check that out. Very similar story. A book called Awaiting Armageddon, How Americans Face the Cuban Missile Crisis by Alice L. George from 2004. Gets into the type of stories we talked about, about how Americans themselves dealt with this crisis. Not just the, the 13 days in October, JFK, RFK, how they dealt with it, but real people and their responses to it. It's a fascinating book. And finally, a similar movie, 2014 Swedish film called Force Majeure, which is what Act of God is how it translates yep. from French. It's a great movie of a family at a ski resort, and there is a false alarm of a incoming avalanche and the mother grabs her two children and holds them tight when this avalanche is coming and the father just runs he just Jeez. gets off the table and oh, runs away that sucks and then it turns out it's a false alarm everyone's okay just a little bit of a scare that was an awkward awkward car ride home well the whole story is essentially how the family tries to piece back their relationship it's it's uh it's pretty crazy and then if you like game of thrones the guy who plays one of the wildlings Hormon Giants Bane in there. In the show, they make him look like a gigantic man with a big beard. In the movie, he's, he's a real skinny dude with a big beard. Check that out. It's a good movie. Force Majeure. Gabe, you got something? Yeah, if you want something a little bit lighter, I would recommend uh, the Simpsons episode Bart's Comet, season season six, episode fourteen, uh, which I guess is we were talking about this is based off of the um, the Twilight Zone episode, The Shelter. A comet is about to hit Springfield, uh, and the whole townspeople have to react to the thought of you know their mortality within the next few minutes, and there's a bunker and some funny stuff. So a little lighter take on the uh, themes we've been talking about. Easier to watch than this 1963 black and white. Can't find it. Ladybug, ladybug. Yep. Thanks for listening to another episode of Super Critical Podcast. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or want to tell us what we got wrong, there are a couple ways you can contact the show. You can see our Facebook page, facebook.com slash supercriticalpodcast, all one word. Twitter, we're at at nuclearpodcast. And email supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the program, please send us a iTunes review. Five stars if pl- applicable, but we'll be accepting four. That sounds good, too. You, know, you can be honest and, and super critical with our efforts here. I appreciate Terrence emailing in the podcast, anyone who does uh, with their stories. Uh, if you happen to want to share your story um, in an iTunes review or an email about where you were, when this took place, this Hawaii missile scare. I'd love to hear it, and we'll talk a little bit about it over t- social media. And until next time, this has been Tim Westmeyer. And Gabe. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we are bound to get super critical about it. Have a good one. Okay.